TV, it's starting to freak me out. It's so loud, it's like my ears are bleeding. What am I feeling? Can't look at the ceiling. Light is so bright, it's like I'm overheating. This mind isn't mine. Who am I to judge? Oh, I should be fine, but it's all too much. I get overwhelmed so easily. My anxiety creeps inside of me, makes it hard to breathe. I can't grow me once and somebody else. I get overwhelmed so easily. My anxiety keeps me silent. When I try to speak, what's come over me feels like I'm somebody else. I get over all of these spaces who don't know what space is and crowds are shut down. I'm overstimulated. Nobody gets this and I'm too sensitive. I can't listen because I'm eyeing the exits. It's mind isn't mine. Who am I to judge? Oh, I should be fine, but it's all too much. I get overwhelmed so easily. My anxiety creeps inside of me, makes it hard to breathe. What comes over me feels like I'm somebody else. I get overwhelmed so easily. My anxiety keeps me silent. When I try to speak, what's come over me feels like I'm somebody else. I get overwhelmed. Should be fine, but it's all too much. I should be fine, but I'm not. I get overwhelmed so easily. My anxiety creeps inside of me, makes it hard to breathe. What comes over me feels like I'm somebody else. I get overwhelmed so easily. Keeps me silent. What's come over me is somebody, somebody else I get overwhelmed A couple of years ago, I found myself sitting at a lunch, and while there may be a photo of that lunch, I do not remember much about what happened. Uh, some of the things I do remember is that at one point, I remember my heart beating so fast that it felt like it was going to come out of my chest. Uh, at one point, I excused myself to go to the restroom to try and gather myself. Uh, in fact, even looking at one or two of those you know, one at that photo, I, I can see that I honestly am not myself in that photo. Uh, at one point, I do remember my friend who's sitting across from me, he said to me, are you okay? And I kind of brushed it off like, you know, it was nothing. Like there was nothing going on, like everything was okay. I, I, I remember feeling what those lyrics that we've just heard in that song, that I get overwhelmed so easily that my anxiety, it creeps inside of me. It makes it hard to breathe. What has come over me? It feels like I'm somebody else. That week was probably the week that I have felt the most overwhelmed in my entire life. I spoke like I am today five different times in seven days in three different cities. Uh, I dislike everything there is to do with travel. 
uh, with air travel specifically. And so four flights along the way did not help my anxiety levels whatsoever. Um, I hardly slept that week, mostly because I was getting up early to try and you know, get on a flight or trying to prepare because there was so much to prepare during that week. And all of that on top of my normal family commitments, uh, we had two, uh, I mean, we've got two girls, but they were younger uh, back then as well. And it felt so surreal because I didn't feel like myself. But what was funny about the situation, and you might think this as well, well, you put yourself in that situation. You put yourself in that position. Yes, I could have said no to uh, all those commitments. I could have said no to the travel. I could have, you know, made sure that I said no to some of those things that I might have some space in my calendar. But my calendar that week was so full that I felt overwhelmed. And if you're looking for a definition of overwhelm, it's this, uh, to bury or drown beneath a huge mass. And you might describe it just like that, that there is a weight on your chest or weight on your shoulders. Maybe you, you feel breathless. And I think we've all experienced something similar to that inside our calendars, where at some point we wake up and we're like, I am just exhausted. All I want is a little bit of space just to take a break from something, right? We, we might experience this in work, or we might experience this when it comes to family. Maybe you're experiencing it now as family's coming to town and it's the summer holidays and you're trying to figure out what to do with the kids. Sometimes during the, the, your schedule during the school year and you're running kids from this to that to this to that. We have all felt overwhelmed and we fill our calendar up to the point where we are overwhelmed. And we understand that when it comes to our calendar, don't we? We understand what overwhelmed feels when it comes to our calendar, but we don't necessarily consider it when it comes to the digital media that we consume. Now, uh, there's a whole bunch of things that are going on at the moment in the artificial intelligence and digital media realm, but what's interesting is that specifically on social media and news, our consumption is up around the 500 minutes a day mark. That is a considerable amount of consumption of digital media. Now, that's everything from the latest movies to series. Maybe it's to uh, some events that are going on, the current affairs that you're trying to keep up with. Maybe it's a review of a product that's coming along that you want to you know, make sure that you're shopping for. Or you just want to catch up and see what your friends and family are doing. That's, it's more than a double, more than double of what it was a little over a decade ago. In fact, the most recent Pew Research says that more than 30% of the material that we find on our major platforms are news and current affairs. That means that for every three posts you see on your favorite platform, one of them is going to be news-related. Now, one of the interesting things that it's not only that there are, we're not only consuming content for nearly 11 hours a day, if you can imagine that, our news consumption has tripled in the same period. That just over a decade, our consumption of digital media has gone up to about 11 hours, and that we have started consuming triple the amount of news and current affairs than we were more just a little over a decade ago. We have gone over the period of just over a decade to drinking from a water fountain to drowning as we're trying to consume a fire hydrant. Now, I'm not saying that digital media is bad, okay? I love, just like everyone else, to connect with friends and family over digital media. I love learning, you know, all kinds of things. YouTube DIY, my favorite thing to go to. I don't know what yours is, but YouTube DIY is my favorite thing to watch. Um, and I love the fact that we get access to information. The information that we have out there that we have access to is phenomenal. But there is one factor that is co commonly overlooked. We, we hear about it. Uh, some of us talk about it. Uh, very few of us actually understand it. I certainly don't understand it. I'm not an expert on it either. But it is one of the biggest contributors to experiencing overwhelm when it comes to our digital media. And when it operates in conjunction with our increase in digital media consumption that we've seen over the last decade or so, there are some serious negative consequences to our consumption when it comes to digital media media, specifically around the idea that we get overwhelmed because of what is happening. And that one thing is the biggest contributor to us experiencing that emotion. But before we get there, we're in part two of the series Authentic Intelligence. And uh, with all the talk out there of uh, artificial intelligence that's happening at the moment, we kind of thought, hey, 
Maybe there's some in interesting topics that we can talk about, and we want to explore the idea of thinking smart in a digital world. And we kicked off the series last week, and we looked at the idea that if we wanted to live differently, we have to think differently. And we introduced this idea that's kind of the basis for the uh, entire series, that as our digital world expands, we find ourselves grappling with new versions of age-old tensions. That we live in a digital world, right? But there are some similar things that we experience that have been experienced for, for centuries. There are some tensions that have been experienced for centuries. And we wanted to try and explore a couple of those throughout the series. Now, for example, uh, there is Jesus one day, he's uh, with his disciples, and they decide that, hey, we, he wants to go across the Sea of Galilee, okay? Uh, he, he's, he's been teaching on the one side, he wants to leave, and they want to go across. So now, the thing you've got to remember is that these disciples, some of them are fishermen, and so they know what it's like to be on the water. Uh, they you know, knew what it was like to be in a storm. They understood what it was like. They used to fish at night, and so they understood all the dangers and the things that were going on uh, with regards to getting a boat from one side of the sea to the other, but they're a group of disciples that are in the boat that are just from the local village. Like, they, they, you know, it's not part of their job to swim, okay? So they probably don't know how to swim, right? And they're getting on a boat, and they're going across the Sea of Galilee. And uh, the fishermen, they knew what was going on. But these other guys, they, they're leaning on what they're experiencing, right? They're leaning on their knowledge and, and what's happening. And the guys who've come from the local uh, village uh, they have more than likely heard a story or two about what happens out at sea. The vicious storms that come along, or the Sea of Galilee was renowned for these massive squalls that would come through. And uh, they've obviously maybe even like, heard of someone who died during that, but they've heard stories about what is going on on the Sea of Galilee when you get out there on a boat. And so all the guys, they get in the boat, they push off, they start heading across the lake, and everything's going great until a storm rolls in. And I, you and I, we live in Georgia. We know what that's like, Right? I mean, the clouds begin to roll in. You can see it coming. The, the sky starts to darken. Uh, you can hear the thunder rolling in. The wind starts to pick up. And these guys, they're just trying to keep direction, right? They're just trying to keep going. The waves start getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, they start crashing over the edge of the boat. And there's water filling up in the bottom of the boat. Now, I don't know about you, but the guys who are from the village are probably sitting there going, as that water is rising, so is the anxiety level, Right? They're looking at this going, I don't think this is supposed to happen, right? But the boat is rocking, and it's beginning to fill up, and I think a lot of them are thinking, this is it. I'm done for. This is it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm about to drown. This is it. But what's interesting is Jesus is in the boat with them. He's right there with them. But what's he doing? He's in the back sleeping, right? He's sleeping in the stern of the boat. And these disciples, they know Jesus is tired. like He's been teaching for a long time, and so they like, hey, we're going to keep this whole thing together as long as we can while the rabbi sleeps in the back. He's taking a nap. But the storm gets so bad that they, they're done. This is it. We, we're going to die. Let's just wake up Jesus. And they wake up Jesus. And some of you might know the story. He rebukes the storm. He says, quiet, be still. And everything calms down. And he, say, he turns to them and he says, why are you so afraid? Do you still not have any faith? Which I think is a very interesting question to kind of just hop out of the story for a moment, that these guys who are in this boat, a lot of them are fishermen, okay? They know what it is like to be on a storm. Probably some of them have weathered a storm on the Sea of Galilee. But that storm that they're in right now got so bad that even those disciples were overwhelmed. They got to the point of being hopeless. And what did they do? They decided to turn and wake Jesus up. What about you? Have you ever got to that point in your life? You've experienced hopelessness and you've turned to Jesus? You've maybe tried to seek Jesus out? That's what the disciples did right here. So Jesus, he wakes up, he calms the storm and asks him this question. And the disciples, we're told, are marveled at this, that even the winds and the waves would obey him. Who is this man? All of their feelings of hopelessness and and dread shift to all in the one who they are in the boat with. All their hopelessness is gone because of who Jesus, in fact, is. And they understood a principle. They, they overwhelmed their hopelessness, rose, rose out of a principle that they knew very much what was going on. The principle is this, that boats don't sink because of the water around them. They sink because the water gets inside of them. I know, it's amazing, right? 
I'm going to read it again just in case you missed it, okay? Boats don't sink because of the water around them. They sink because that water gets inside of them. Now, you and I, we live in an ocean of digital media. And you and I risk sinking if we allow that digital media to get inside of us. You and I can be easily overwhelmed if uh, that increasing, our increasing consumption of digital media begins to wash over the edge of our boat and begins to fill up inside our boat. Maybe a more succinct way to say this would be this, that to stay afloat, we must keep water out of the boat. Because the question is not whether more digital media has come. That's a fact that we have to embrace. Every single indicator that you read about indicates that there is going to be more digital media, and it is increasing day by day. The question is, how do we stay afloat when the waves of digital media around us continue to crash against our boat? How do we keep the waters from getting inside our boat? We talk about that. Let's go back to the biggest con con uh, contributor to our experience when it comes to overwhelm and digital media. And that simple one word that's the biggest contributor is the algorithm. Now, the algorithm is simply a set of rules that dictates how something is going to operate. So when it comes to digital media and social media, uh, all it does is it says, okay, it dictates what posts you do see and what posts you don't see. It dictates what news you see and what news articles you do not see. It determines by a set of rules what adverts you see and what adverts you do not see. The algorithm also begins to dictate what order, the order in which you see those things. And you know what? The order in which that is and how the algorithm applies its sets of rules is all based on the inputs that you and I give it. Now, those inputs are our clicks that we do when we're interacting with digital media. And so if you click on a link that maybe a friend has sent you, the algorithm goes, oh, you must like that. After all, you clicked on that. And so it goes and finds more things and sends you those exact same things. So if someone sends you a, a, a social media post and you click on that, the algorithm goes, oh, you must like this because you clicked on it. I'm going to go find some more things and give those to you. If you click on, if you search for some content and you click on a link, the algorithm goes, oh, you must like that because after all, you clicked on it and it sends you some more content. If you click on some news article, the algorithm goes, oh, you must like that because you clicked on it. Therefore, I'm going to go find some more things and give that to you. What's interesting about the algorithm is it doesn't factor in our religious views doesn't factor in our point of view. It doesn't factor in any kind of uh, stance, stance or value that we might have. It doesn't factor any of that is. It just goes, oh, you clicked on that. You must like that. Therefore, I'll go and find you some more things of the same thing and give those along to you. Now, along with social media, social media is an interesting one because you and I have the choice of who we follow, right? Uh, we curate a group of people that is just like you and me. And you might be like, yeah, well, obviously, well, because, I mean, no one has ever heard of anyone following their enemies on social media, right? Anybody? No, you don't follow your enemies? No, see? So we curate a group of people who are exactly like us. They think the same way. They have similar worldviews. Uh, we share similar content together. We like the same things. And what ends up happening is when you add the algorithm to our social media networks, we suddenly get what is called an echo chamber. And we, get we start to begin to live inside this echo chamber. And it means that we're only seeing the posts and things that are similar to our views. Everything that happens within that echo chamber begins to be curated amongst the group of people that we have. In fact, if one friend inside that echo chamber decides to share some kind of tragedy and enough of us click on it, the algorithm goes, oh, this group must like that content. It goes and finds similar content and then pours that into all our social media feeds. And we've made that echo chamber and the algorithm just goes, oh, you must like that because you clicked on it, let me grab some more of that and throws it in there. And if we stay too long inside that echo chamber, when it is operating under the uh, rules set, rule set up by the algorithm, we can become hopeless. And sometimes, when we get on a negative media run especially, we can end up in a state of depression. But our digital media platforms, they're designed to keep us on the platform. You see, initially, they're rewarding, right? Uh, they, they kind of uh, give you an initial reward when you open up the app, and then it resorts to sporadic rewards. What happens is uh, sporadic rewards are sometimes referred to as 
clickbait. You open up a social media and you see something that you love. Maybe it's a friend or family member. They post great picture, kids smiling. You know, everyone loves that. Uh, you love that and you're like, oh, well, I'll just keep scrolling, right? And you go up and the pattern ends up becoming, uh, you know, sporadic reward, sporadic reward, sporadic reward. It's why some of you open up an app and 30 minutes later you go, what have I been looking at for the last 30 minutes? And you've wasted 30 minutes of your life. It's a considerable amount of time. It's probably why we're spending more than 11 hours on our phones consuming digital media every single day. But after, after the initial reward, what happens on those digital platforms, it becomes a pattern. The pattern is boring, 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 reward. Boring, 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 reward. Boring, 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 reward. Boring, 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 reward. And that reward comes in the form of clickbait. And it's normally a riot, a tragedy. Uh, maybe it's some kind of act of terrorism. Maybe it's a product that you've been looking at. And a digital media platform puts that in there so you might click. And if you click, the algorithm goes, oh, you must like this because after all, you clicked on it, right? And it goes and finds you more information exactly the same and it sends it your way. And we end up going through a cycle of the more you scroll, the more you see, the more you click, the more you scroll, the more you see, the more you click. You see, when digital media is combined with the algorithm, it is designed in such a way that we spend more and more and more time consuming digital media. And as those waves of digital media continue to roll in, they begin to splash over the edge and they begin to fill our boats up. And the platforms are designed in such a way that at the beginning they release a small amount of, a, of dopamine. And dopamine in small quantities is good for us. But if we begin to spend too much time on social media, the algorithm keeps us scrolling and our echo chamber begins to feed us information of all of the same things that we've been clicking on and sends us down a negative media storm, our boats begin to fill up as those waves begin to come over the edge and we get overwhelmed. And the problem is that you and I cannot look away because it goes, oh, here's a little bit of dopamine. Here's a small reward. And we just keep on scrolling. And so just like you and I, we might experience overwhelm in our calendar our bodies begin to experience overwhelm as our consumption of digital media increases, and it produces two hormones, adrenaline and cortisol. And those two hormones are the main contributors to us experiencing what is a human natural response, fight or flight. Now, when we spend too much time on social media and the adrenaline starts to rise in our bodies, what happens is we get aggressive right, and, and we want to seek justice, or maybe it leads you to getting into a battle in, uh, in the comments section. Anybody done that? No hands, please. Uh, maybe it turns into a rant, or, or maybe you just want to complain about something, right? But when there's too much cortisol in our bodies, we tend to retract. We become fearful, and we don't want to see anything more about what is happening on our social media feeds, but we can't because the algorithm is sending us more and more and more of that little bit of dopamine, a little bit of reward, and we want to get off, but we can't. And we end up being overwhelmed. We end up being hopeless. Sometimes we end up getting depressed. But the truth is that digital media, it's everywhere. And you and I get the opportunity to be able to enjoy digital media. But when digital media begins to wash over the edge of our boat, it begins to fill up inside our boat, we run the risk of sinking and we get overwhelmed. And our natural response in that is either fight or flight. When we get overwhelmed, we want to fight or flight. But that response didn't work so well for the disciples. One night, uh, Jesus uh, grabs a small group of disciples, and they head off into the Garden of Gethsemane. And he goes off to pray and asks the guys to be there with him, hey, would you sit and just keep watch? And some of you know the story. He comes back there asleep. He wakes him up, and he goes back, and that happens a couple of times. And eventually, he comes back one last time, and in walks Judas with a whole bunch of Roman soldiers. Now, the disciples sitting there go, anytime there's Roman soldiers around, they know there's trouble coming. But this time, they walk in with Judas, and they're wondering what in the world is going on. Judas walks up to Jesus, gives him a kiss on the cheek, and suddenly the Roman soldiers move in to arrest Jesus and the disciples that are sitting there are suddenly hopeless because Jesus was supposed to be their king. Jesus was supposed to overthrow the Romans and take them to power, and they were going to sit on the left and the right of Jesus as he became their king. But the disciples, 
They respond like you and I when we experience overwhelm, when we experience hopelessness. They chose fight or flight. Peter, he's got a sword. He whips that out and he cuts off a soldier's ear. Mark, unfortunately, he's been hiding in a bush nearby and he gets caught by the Roman Roman soldiers and decides, no, flight's my option. And he runs away naked because he wrestles out of his night garments and the, the, the soldiers are left holding his night garments as he runs away naked in the moonlight. Jesus, he's arrested right there and there. But what's interesting is that moments before this, mere mere hours before this, that group of disciples were sitting around the table having a meal with Jesus. And they spoke about a lot during that meal, but that meal started by Jesus washing their feet. Jesus starts talking about the betrayal that he's about to experience, how Peter's going to deny him three times, how the, the father is going to, Uh, how he is like the Father. They talked about how Jesus is going to leave a helper with him, that God is going to send him a helper in the form of the Holy Spirit. They talked about all kinds of things that night. And then towards the end of the message, Jesus turns to them and says this, that I've told you these things, and and I've just got to let you know, there are some really disturbing things in there for those disciples, that they had their worldview and their mindset on what was going to be happening. And Jesus tells them all these things, and some of them are really, really disturbed. It's really interesting. But I've told you these things that, so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. And what's interesting is that uh, Jesus right here draws a parallel between these two, in me and in this world. He says that if you're going to try and find peace in me, in Jesus, you will find peace. But if you try and find that in the world, well, that's not going to go so well for you. In fact, look at, the, look at the phrasing he uses just before these. He says, that, um, he says that you may have peace and you will have trouble. You see, trying to find peace or security anywhere other than in Jesus is pointless. It's going to lead to trouble. In fact, if you read this in the phrasing that it is in, uh, it's almost like there is certainty because he uses that word will. That in fact, if you try and find peace in this world and security in this world, you are guaranteed to find trouble and you're not going to find peace anywhere else other than Jesus. But look also, he makes a comparison between these two words, the peace and trouble. He goes into to discuss that. And peace in this context, when we hear the word peace, we kind of think about war, fighting. But Jesus here, he's talking about inner peace. Not, not peace that the world would give us, that we experience in the happenings around us, maybe in the form of happiness, but inner peace that flows out from within us that is given to us by the Prince of Peace when we abide in Jesus. But Jesus, he's not finished. He says, I've told you these things that so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Take heart, there is, have courage. It is the moral or or mental strength to venture, to persevere, to withstand danger, fear, or difficulty. And rather than reacting in, in panic or doubt, followers need to have mental and moral strength to persevere through the troubles that we face. And that we can have a sense of peace knowing that Jesus, notice the tense here, he has overcome. I have overcome the world. He doesn't say, I will overcome. He says, I have overcome the world. And you've got to remember, he's saying this in the shadow of the cross. Hours before he was going to be betrayed by his disciple, hours before his, one of his closest followers would abandon him, and his disciples would run away and deny ever knowing Jesus, hours before he would be flogged and mocked and spat on, hours before he would be hung on a cross. Yet he declares, I have overcome the world. Not I will, but I have. In other words, Jesus has already spoken to that which we experience in the world. He was able to face what was to come because of who he is. He's the son of God. But as his followers... As we follow Jesus, we too can face absolutely anything because in him, we too have overcome. But let's go back to that boat for a moment. The disciples, they're sitting there. They're overwhelmed by what is happening around them. They're hopeless 
Each and every one of them is hopeless, except for maybe Jesus, because he seems to be at peace with everything, him and he's falling asleep in the back of the boat. But every single one of those disciples on that boat feel exactly the same way. There's more water and more water and more water and more water. And just like you and me, when we feel hopeless, when we feel overwhelmed, we, we want to wake up Jesus. And they do that, and Jesus gets up and he calms the storm. And remember how in awe they were? That even the wind and the waves would obey. You see, their hopelessness is completely drowned out by who Jesus is. By the realization that Jesus Christ has already overcome in the world, over, overcome the world. But just like you and me, and just like those disciples, we forget that. We forget that we too have overcome the world because of Jesus. And because of that, we can have hope. You see, the digital world, it shows me all the reasons I should be overwhelmed, depressed, and hopeless, rather than confident in the King. The digital world shows me all the reasons I should be overwhelmed, depressed, and hopeless, rather than confident in our King. Now, you might be sitting here today, you might be listening and going, well, like we live in a digital world. Like how am I supposed to have confidence in a king when the waves are crashing, waves of digital media are crashing into my boat? How am I supposed to have confidence in the king when, when I am just overwhelmed? When, when everyone else around me seems to be thinking for me because I'm so overwhelmed that I cannot think for myself. If the algorithm is adding all these things into my media feed, how am I supposed to have confidence in the king? How am I supposed to have confidence in the king when everything I read, everything I see, everything I hear leads me ultimately to be depressed, to hopelessness, to being overwhelmed? Well, I think there are three things that we can do, and they're not original to me, but I think they're extremely helpful when we think about how we keep water out of our boats when it comes to digital media. It's these three things. Examine your habits, explore the silence, and take a break. Examine your habits. I want to ask you, what are you viewing? What kind of digital media are you consuming? Are you watching TV and scrolling on your phone at the same time? What type of, I hear some giggles in the front here. What type of media are you consuming? Are, are you, are you, you know, opening the Bible app every day? Even just to read the verse of the day? Have you noticed any healthy habits that people are doing that maybe that's what you need to include in your day as well? I would say examine your habits Remove anything that is adding water into the boat. The second one is explore the silence. I'm going to ask you, when the world goes silent, when things around you go silent, where do you go? Where do you turn? Specifically, to which app do you turn? Because let's be honest, when we're waiting on someone or something, or we're standing in a line, or we're standing in an elevator, what do we do? We pull out our phone. And we begin to consume more and more digital media instead of being okay with the silence and listening for the still, small voice of God. You are never going to find peace in the scrolling. You will only find peace in Jesus. The third thing is this, is to take a break. When last did you go for a walk and you didn't take your phone? Maybe there is one or two apps that you need to remove off your phone, you need to take a break from. Maybe there are some friends or maybe there's some accounts on social media that you need to take a break from. They're ranting and complaining all the time, which, by the way, does nothing for the actual situation and just adds negativity to the world. But is there a friend or an account that you need to take a break from? Maybe there's someone who is always sharing sensational news. Is it maybe time to take a break from that person? Maybe the news altogether. Is there maybe a time that you need to take a break from that news channel? Maybe you need to take a break from the content because taking a break from the content is going to keep water out of the boat. Take a break from anything that is allowing water into the boat. You see, one thing that worked for me is, uh, you know, at that lunch, we were sitting down and we were having, I mean, what looked like a good meal. Again, I don't remember it much, but... Our friends who had come that day had decided that after our meal, we were staying on a sustain they were staying on a sustainable farm and we had joined them for lunch there, that they were going to take us on a Segway tour. Now, I've got to be honest, I did not want to go, okay? 
You can see from that pic, I'm not myself. I didn't feel like myself. I had so much prep to do. I knew I had a flight the next day. I, I didn't want to go, but I was like, I'll go along for it. These friends had flown half around the world to come see us, and I, 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 you know, I really wanted to, to honor them in that. And what made it worse was they took us to the Segway tour, and the Segway company makes, teaches you how to drive a Segway, which, by the way, is a little bit more difficult than you think it might be. But they teach you how to drive a Segway, and then they actually, they actually put you through a driving test. Like, you have to prove that you can drive the Segway before they'll take you on a tour. So I had to go through all of that, and then we finally get on our tour, and I'm like, I didn't want to do this in the first place. Like, why are we here, you know? But it wasn't until about halfway through our tour that we climbed off our Segways, and we're standing in a field, and we were swamped by hundreds of chickens that I suddenly realized, this is actually quite fun. I felt myself lighten. I, I, I felt the anxiety lift off. I, I suddenly felt like I could enjoy the moment. And we rode on a little bit more, and here, here's another photo of us. Uh, and visibly, I am looking better. And we got back to the car, and I said to my wife, like, I needed that. Like, I didn't want it, but I needed that. I needed to take a proper break in the middle of what was a very hectic week. Now, I'm not saying that you need to take a Segway tour, although it is pretty fun, but you do need to take a break from what you're doing. You need to, do need to take a break from what's happening on your phone. But I will tell you this, that it is very difficult to scroll on digital media while driving on a Segway, so there is that. <laughs> we live in a digital world. There's no denying that. And the digital world shows us every single reason why we can be overwhelmed, why we can be depressed, why we can be hopeless. But trying to find peace in anything other than Jesus Christ is pointless. And so this week, would you consider examining your habits? Explore the silence and maybe take a break. Because if you and I in a digital world want to stay afloat in this world, we have to try and do everything we can to keep water out of the boat. And doing that will ultimately help us think differently in a digital world. Let me pray for us. Father God, firstly, I just want to thank you for your son, Jesus, that he sent. And we have accounts that have somehow survived antiquity that we can read about what your son was like in this world. And that from him, we can learn what you're like. And then, Father God, that you, you sent your son to not only overcome the world, but to be able to provide a way that we might live in that. That as those waves and the storm roll in and we experience overwhelm and hopelessness, that, Father God, we, we can look to Jesus, that we can look to your Son, and, Father God, that we can experience inner peace, knowing that your Son overcame the world and that we might be able to live in and through that. And Father God, I pray for everyone here, everyone listening, that today we might be able to have the wisdom to know what to do, the wisdom to know where we might need to explore the silence, maybe examine our habits, or maybe even take a break. But Father God, more than that, that we would have the courage to go out and do those things. Because Father God, at the end of the day, we want to find and follow your son, Jesus. We thank you for